Hello and welcome to Bend the Knee, a Song of Ice and Fire podcast. I am Sir Matt, and this is Fallout Friday. Yeah, I'm flying solo this week. Jimmy is out. He is on his quarterly trip to his company's work in uh, Denver, which he absolutely hates. So uh, send him some good wishes and positivity when he comes back from that uh, on this coming Sunday. But... There was a lot of response to this week's episode of House of the Dragon, and you guys sent us in a ton of ravens and theories, so we're just going to sort of fire into those and just lightning round this thing and just uh, knock it out. So with that, here we go. This one comes to us from Sir Bill the Fretful, who says, Love listening to you guys talk through legitimate versus silly criticisms of the show as book readers. One thing I've been thinking about a lot is the lack of non-war interactions between writers and their dragons. In the books, dragons are like big dogs that, oca- that are occasionally useful in war. In the show, they feel like instruments of war only. Do you think this is because of budget mostly? Because there are other ways of doing this through dialogue, similar scenes with a ton of CGI leaning against their dragon while talking to another character. I'm afraid this creates detachment and minimizes the impact of Dragon's death, both in and of themselves, as well as the impact on their writers. What do you think? Yeah, Bill, you know, that actually is a pretty good statement. The less we see of the dragons, the less impact there is when they die. I mean, even though we only saw Sunfire in one episode, just that one little interaction between him and Aegon totally changed the way we feel about it and the way we felt about it at the end of episode four. So the more we get of it, you know, we did get a couple instances, right? We've seen Rainies and Maylees quite a few times. So when she goes to talk to Maylees before she flies out for her last ride and she's saying, you know, well, all right, one more time, girl, you know, or whatever it is, the exact line she says there. It really made that impact even more when the dragon looks back. So, yeah, the more we see the dragons, obviously, the more we would feel attached to them and the more we will feel that bond between the two. So, yeah, I agree. We should actually see them more, even if it is smaller scenes. I totally agree with that. Okay, here we go. This is from Lady Rachel, who says, hope you are both doing well. I had some thoughts about the latest episode of House of the Dragon. There was so much foreshadowing for future events in the discussion of the small folk and how they shouldn't be dismissed. Even when Masaria is talking about how you shouldn't underestimate them, it cuts back to Rhaenyra and the dragon skull behind her, hinting at the ultimate death and end of the dragons. Sometimes I wish I didn't know what's coming after reading the books, but moments like but it's moments like these where I think, you know, where I think not sure if this can be shared in the pod, but that's my two cents. Now, she does go a little bit more into spoiler territory here. So I kind of cut that up just a little bit. But obviously, anybody who's seen Game of Thrones knows that, you know, dragons don't exist. Right. That's why when they come back with Daenerys, it's such a big deal. So, yeah, I think I'll touch on your on your moment here where sometimes I wish I didn't know what was coming after reading the books. But it's moments like these where I think. Yeah, it is one of the things, but I think that's one of the best parts about House of the Dragon is, you know, we knew, like I knew going into episode four that Rainey's was going to die. I didn't know that it was going to be as powerful and emotional as it was when I saw it on screen. So it is, you know, it's one of those things with any fandom. If you've read the content and you know what's going to happen, you get to see ultimately how it plays out. Is it the same as being as shocking as witnessing it for the first time, right? You know, that's why there's all those great videos out there of people watching the Red Wedding for the first time. And, you know, if they're with somebody who has seen it, they're just like, keep looking at them, waiting to see what's going to go down. So it's just part of the, uh, it's just part of the equation. But yeah, I would definitely say that the small folk do play a pretty big part in this war. And we're going to see that episode by episode. I think we'll see that quite a bit more in next week's episode, right? Uh, The Dragon Seeds. That's not a total uh, spoiler since I did hint at it at the very, very end and pretty much said that's what they're going to do. So it's going to be a very fun episode in episode six. And I actually think it might be one of the most comedic episodes, not having seen anything on it yet. But, uh, you know, I mean, there's just going to be people trying to claim dragons. Yeah, I mean, obviously... Some people are going to get eaten. I don't think that's spoiler territory. I think that's just sort of common sense. But yeah, great. Thank you for the raven. Okay, here we go. This is another one here from Sir Marcus saying, 
Alice Rivers, House of the Dragon Season 2, Episode 5. Not a book reader yet, so I'm trying to figure out who Alice Rivers is and her purpose. We've been wondering if anyone else can see her, if she's a figure of Damon's imagination or a ghost that only he can see. Again, in Episode 5, we see no one else speak to her. Simon Strong walks in at one point and looks her way. He seems to just glance at the direction that Damon is looking at and is confused. He didn't track her and move his head like you would with someone walking past. But the thing I wanted to point out here, which I didn't hear you guys mention on the podcast, is that she disappears into the background. Go back and watch. When she goes behind the side of Sir Simon, she doesn't come out. Very strange. I really hope the show fleshes out her character since they don't... Uh, and they don't season eight us, right? Yeah. So for anyone new listening, right, we made some jokes because uh, Sir Jimmy keeps saying flushes out. And so now it seems uh, quite a lot of people are <laughs> sending in uh, and wanting to, uh, you know, make an example of that word. So, yeah, Alice Rivers is definitely interesting to see what they're going to do with her. And I'll tell you this in the books, we actually like don't even know. So she's a character that is a total mystery as to what's going to even happen to her. So they could really do whatever they want with her in the show. And I think it would actually kind of work. So that's definitely something that's pretty interesting is, you know, a lot of the other characters we know, you know, what happens to them, pretty much all the other main characters. We certainly know what happens to them, you know, because it's the history books and you move all the way up to like Game of Thrones. These characters will have been dead for over 100 years. So. Yeah, but she is one that even the books, it's pretty mysterious on just exactly who she is, what she is, and her end is we don't even know. So she's a total wild card with what they could do with her. And I think it's working out very well for the show since they can use her as possibly even a ghost and not even like a real person. So I very much like what they're doing with Alice Rivers. Okay. So here we go. Uh, this is from Ronnie Mack saying, I can't get over how poorly this episode reflected on the queen who never was. A clear fan favorite, yet only two brief shots of Corliss and Rhaenyra showing remorse at the start of at the start, and that was it. No real emotion from Bela, Reyna, or Damon. I heard she used to be like a babysitter for Viserys and Damon in their childhood. Anyway, all good. Yeah, that's something Jimmy and I talked on. I think I would have liked to feel a little bit more of the weight of her death especially since it was like so powerful and it felt like such a big deal. And it does seem like they didn't really take a lot of time to have that impact hit, especially when, if you go back and you look at the books, like this episode, I'm not saying it's filler content, but they definitely sort of expanded a lot of stuff that I didn't think they would in terms of the pacing of the overall show. I mean, if you go back and you read fire and blood, like the next thing that sort of happens is immediately next week's episode. So this episode was definitely a breather to take pace after like the big episode that was last week. But I agree. I agree with you. And that's something I mentioned on the uh, recap of episode five was Jimmy and I both felt, yeah, that we should have felt that weight just a little bit more. And it just didn't to me. Yeah, I didn't hit maybe as hard as they were hoping it would, which with that one sort of scene of Corliss there at the beginning. Okay, here we go. This one is from Sir uh, Ben Garrett saying, Good day, sirs. Longtime listener since the days of season eight. After Game of Thrones ended, I wanted to continue listening to the podcast. So I downloaded the audiobooks and started listening to the main books. Uh, all of them. The main series, World of Ice and Fire, Fire and Blood, Night of the Seven Kingdoms. He says, thank you for the inspiration. In episode five, Crispy Cole mentions that Sunfire was slow in dying. Do you think that this is a lie or that they're changing it from the books? Um, I don't want to go into what Sunfire's role will be going forward, just because that is spoiler territory. It says, also, I think that the Blackwoods and Brackens being set up in the show will tie heavily into the Night of the Seven Kingdoms, since two of the Great Bastards are from these rival houses. Do you think we will see Bittersteel, possibly in the second season during a flashback or a red grass field? I'm excited for the season of House of the Dragon, but also excited to get back to our reread. And yeah, I know we have a lot of new people listening. So what Jimmy and I do on the podcast when there's not, you know, House of the Dragon or the upcoming Dunkin' Egg, you know, Night of the Seven Kingdoms show is we're going through the main series, going chapter by chapter. We're in a storm of swords right now. And it's a lot of fun diving back and rereading the main series and being able to kind of do it as a book club as we go along. So I will say, yeah, I think what they're doing with Sunfire is I think Sunfire is still alive. And I think if you listen two people kind of mention it and one, uh, I think it's like Rhaenyra saying, oh, believes that Sunfire is dead. And Crispin Cole said, or 
Kristen Cole, you know, we call him crispy Cole says that, right. He's slow and dying. So even he doesn't necessarily know. So I think it's more, it's just sort of, they don't necessarily know what's going to happen with Sunfire, but I do believe that Sunfire is going to continue to live. And, uh, I think we'll fulfill Sunfire's role in the books without getting into spoilers. Okay, the other point he makes here is, do you think we'll see Bitter Steel in like a flashback in the Dunkin' Egg show? It's hard to say at this point, just because we don't know that much about the Dunkin' Egg show and what it's ultimately going to look like and feel like. But yeah, I definitely imagine it will be very Blackfire Rebellion heavy and we will likely get some of those characters for sure. Here we go. Now moving on to the uh, ones on Instagram here. So this one comes to us from Sir Chris saying, it's interesting to me how in House of the Dragon, dragons aren't really considered war assets unless they have a dragon rider. But in Game of Thrones, Danny is able to command slash use all three of her dragons in battle, but only rides Drogon. Just a thought I had. Yeah, actually, you know, I was talking about that as well. I was, um, you and I were both invited onto a podcast called That Witch Life which is these three women who uh, explore like witchcraft in our world, as well as in other fandoms and things like that. And that was definitely a, a fun thing over there. That's going to be coming out in a couple of weeks. You can go check out their podcast for that. But actually that's something we were talking about. We recorded it last night as um, I brought up the fact that, yeah, you know, when you think about it, especially now that we are exploring dragon bonds more in house of the dragon, it almost does make Daenerys's connection to her dragons that seem that much more powerful is that she is connected to three at once, which we don't really see anybody else do being connected to like multiple dragons at the same time. So that's definitely very interesting. And perhaps, you know, that could be something that gets added to you know another piece of content down the line to give more power to or, you know more context to daenerys and make her feel like that much more important of a character right i mean uh i think you know if you go look at like star wars i think the mandalorian is a great example where you can do stuff in a show that takes place in between you know the original series and then the the sequels which a lot of people didn't like the sequels and you can do things that will kind of help fix some of the problems of those right you can look like the clone wars cartoon which fixed a lot of the problems in the prequels and added depth so that is something you know maybe even if they just did one small line of you know ooh, nobody can be bonded to more than one dragon at once or something like that like a line like that would go a long way into adding a lot of power to daenerys's character and make her feel that much more important but yeah it, it certainly is interesting that uh, at least here in house of the dragon feels like you can pretty much only be bonded with one Okay, this one comes to us from a lady, Sammy, who says, follow up Friday question. That was definitely Diana, who Masaria sent that serving woman to meet in King's Landing. Do you think she's going to convince Diana or is it Dinah? I, it's D-Y-A-N-A. -A. I, I forgetting how exactly they pronounce it in the show. To, but anyway, regardless, to tell everyone that Aegon sexually assaulted her to besmirch his name. Or I wonder if they're just using her for other small folk purposes because we've seen her before and it won't be about like the sexual assault, right? That uh, she got kicked out of being a handmaiden for. So uh, again, I don't want to just keep pumping the Patreon episode we did a little bit ago, but we did touch a lot on where I think her character could go. And I actually think they're setting her up for something very important that may even come at the end of the season. We'll have to see how we get there and uh, the way it goes. But certainly Masaria and the small folk are going to have a very important role in this entire war and what the outcome is going to be. Um, you know, with, if you want to sort of look up spoiler territory, I'll just mention a character's name that you can go look up. It's the shepherd in house of the dragon. And I think she could actually fill this role. It's kind of a mysterious character. They don't really know who it is, but they sort of play a very important role with the small folk going forward. And some of the things that the small folk will do on the impact of this war. I almost think she might end up being that character, which is crazy that they would go down that route. So we'll certainly have to see the role that she plays going forward, even if it is just, again, helping to stir up the small folk, which we see is happening, right? Like we've seen Hugh Hammer, you know, he tried to escape with his children. He wasn't able to. 
and you know the rat catchers being hung and now they're dragging the dragon heads through the street and people are saying it's a bad omen so there's definitely unrest building and i certainly think she's going to be a part of that if not potentially at like the spearhead of that which could be pretty cool okay so uh you know we did this last week and we're going to continue to we're We've been doing this throughout the season, so we can show what you guys are are thinking over on our YouTube poll about the episode. So this episode for me, I gave a three out of five stars, which for me is still good. It's not great or amazing, which is pretty much what I have as uh, my five tier ranking, which I gave last week's episode, which I think is like a top 10 episode of all of Game of Thrones. So I certainly didn't dislike it, but it is my lowest rated of the season. So if you go back... You know, episode one, you've got 31, 55, and 12. Uh, episode two, 57, 33, and seven. This is five star, four star, three star. And then two and one are pretty much always at about one to two percent. Um, episode three, excuse me, 40, 39, 16. Episode four, 83 percent five star. And this one, uh, 32, 40, and 22, which I believe is the highest of any of the three star ratings. But still, people, you know, I mean, it's still definitely a good rating for the show. Certainly not like great or amazing, which is, again, how I view it. But that seems to be the case. You guys all pretty much agree. You know, you really seem to sort of like it. So uh, we'll continue diving into some of the comments you guys have here. I'm really liking the writers working in the plight of the small folk and how the conquest and battle often leads to atrocities of the innocent. Again, that ties into the Raven we just did. Classic Game of Thrones, the mechanic of politics. Oh, that scene between Cole and Allison, just great acting. Fabian giving such a great performance that I actually felt sorry for him, which is a good point when you look and think about his um, his character. Liking the season so far, but I believe Damon Arc has been the weakest part of the season. Really like the scenes with the small folk and that they're going to start getting the dragon seeds. Um, three stars, pretty mid-episode. Uh, a lot of the thing, little things really irk me or, or uh, irked. Why would the small folk be tearful over the death of Melis? Uh, so that I think is because they view the dragons as gods. You have to remember that they've, you know, since egg on the conqueror, they have viewed the dragons as pretty important. So even still, you know, they didn't ask for this war. They were a lot of them were killed by Melis, right? When they were in the, when they're in the dragon pit and for egg on the conqueror ceremony, egg on, the second ceremony, I should say. So a lot of people view these dragons as powerful things. So a uh, great episode has house Bracken good episode. So yeah, seeing a lot of goods, seeing a lot of great, um, the show is miles better than that boring game of Thrones. So this person likes it more than game of Thrones. So yeah, I mean, I'll get the other ones pulled up here too. I think this episode again, it was a breather. I think a lot of people are, you know, viewing this as you needed some calming down after the big epicness, right? That was episode four. And that's okay. You know, this is like the mid season sort of restart since there's only eight episodes. We have three left, six, seven, and eight. This episode needed to be that kind of reset and begin building towards the end of this season. So, all right, now I'll pull up your guys comments here on the uh on the youtube page on the video as well yeah 14 it was diane uh diane diana uh she already appeared in the season episode three yeah that's who i thought it was i had mentioned i couldn't see it because i had the there's just a little bit of a glare on my on my screen and i just happened to miss it but then jimmy and i always go record immediately so we can get the episode out to you guys as quickly as possible uh, the table and the phrase scene is weird because it's not a table, but one half of a gate. Yeah, it just, again, it just caught me off guard for one quick second. And I saw that the fray table was a door. Uh, college chemistry tutorial says, great review. I agree with most everything. I'm a little higher on the episode than most. I enjoyed all the different places and moving along the story arcs. Damon, Sir Simon Strong, subtle comic relief is genius. And that is a great point. We really do need that comedic relief in this show. Because, uh, you know, like you didn't you didn't get a lot of that in, in Game of Thrones. There's a lot of Tyrion making jokes here and there. And so it sort of helps everything not feel as crazy and super dramatic. And you need that to kind of like carry the audience along. He says, it reminds me of Arya the Hound, Tyrion and Bronn. High Heart was mentioned. And finally, Viserys tells Damon in series one, you were always mother's favorite. Weird after this episode, for sure. <laughs> um 
FPS, flush out or flush out Sir Jimmy, UBU, whatever you want to say is fine with me. Continuing on here, uh, Sophie King says, Alice, Alice has entirely vanished from the scene at one point when Sir Simon Strong walks in and she goes to leave the room. She walks behind him, but you don't see her going away. So yeah, a lot of people picking up on that as well. Do you think Lenor will ever come back? Raina asks, uh, Rhaenyra asks Raina to write someone in Pento so her boys can go there for safety. Maybe Lenor gets involved. Maybe he'll ride Sea Smoke again. Yeah, we'll have to see. Um, you know, the, the big difference in, in that this show and the books is, is that in the books, Lenor is just dead, right? So we don't know. Uh, anything, anything they do with him at this point is totally different. Um, Emma Darcy mentions Visenya as the first wield dark, uh, dark sister or Rhaenyra, the first to wield dark sister. It's unlikely that she was the first to wield dark sister like Blackfire. Both were forged in the doom at least 85 years or earlier. Someone else must have wielded it for her. Perhaps Danny's the dreamer. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, I think maybe what she was really more referring to was the first Targaryen queen to wield it or whatever. Yeah. Um, but that is correct. People probably obviously did use Blackfire and Dark Sister in the Targaryen household before uh, them. They're just sort of the first that's told in Westeros history. Oh, Sir Matt, are you outside your mind? Of course, people would listen to Corliss if he was King Consort. Did you forget the last episode of the Black Council was questioning Princess Rainey's when Corliss walked in and they all back, back down to him? Yeah, I guess what I'm referring to is I think that... You know, the difference is, do you think more people would listen to Corlys Valerian as King Consort, or do you think they'd listen to Daemon Targaryen as King Consort, right? I mean, there's a difference. And I think that's what Daemon is, ultim was, is ultimately thinking in his mind, is that he, if he and Rhaenyra take the throne, are people going to look to him, a true Targaryen, as king more than they would look to Rhaenyra? Sure. Would people look to... Corlys Valerian as king more as the leader than Rhaenys Targaryen. Like they've always had Targaryen rulers. I guess that's what I'm what I'm trying to get at. I'm not saying nobody would listen to Corlys. Maybe that's what I hint. Maybe that's the way I phrase it in the episode. But I would say that the point I was trying to make was I think Damon has a point in saying like you know who are they going to listen to when I take if, if we take the Iron Throne? They're going to listen to me. So I think that Damon certainly has a point there. Okay, and then finally, uh, Bobby Shabby says, found this episode pretty tedious. The Damon subplot is a bit of a mess. Even Rhaenyra's council scene is tedious. Yeah, I will say the Damon subplot, I think it's just because last season, Damon was leading almost the entire show, it felt like. And we were, everybody was so interested in him. He had big epic battle scenes, right? I mean, he was always there stirring the pot. And this season... He's off at Heron Hall doing his own thing. And it just feels feels awkward, feels weird, which maybe is what the directors wanted to do. I mean, they're also following the story and Damon does go to Heron Hall and is gone while a lot of these other things happen. And it feels like if Damon were there, things might go differently. But that's what happens in the books. And I think that they're doing a great job of showcasing that when then when Damon does decide to make some moves, it's going to feel like you'll feel the weight of Damon making those moves and it will show just how powerful and important his character actually is. Okay. With that, I know that's sort of just a lightning round, but you know, it's just me flying solo this week. So, uh, you know, no back and forth, obviously to, uh, fill up the time, but those are just my thoughts. And, you know, thank you guys for sharing all your Ravens. We will be back next week. Jimmy will be back. We'll be, have some more Patreon content that will be coming to some like heavy spoilers, stuff as well we will be diving into so appreciate all the guys that have been appreciate everyone who has been following us over there or you can get it on an apple premium if you just like go in your itunes for that and everyone who's been sending us ravens and comments and everything we very much appreciate it so much fun when westeros is when westeros tv is big and the thing so with that guys as always we'll see you on sunday and i uh, hope you guys have a great rest of your week and remember that winter is coming.